I'm going to talk about Turing, the father of uh, computer science, and while doing so, I'm going to talk about the contents of my book, uh, The Dawn of Software Engineering from Turing to Dijkstra. Uh, for my research, I have uh, interviewed Turing Award winners, including Tony Hoare and Peter Nauer, and I have also relied on an interview by uh, Thomas Haig with the Turing Award winner Charles Bachmann. Tony Hoare told me that he tried to read uh, Turing's uh, 1936 paper uh, during the early 50s, but with uh, difficulty. Later, he read Martin Davis's book, uh, Computability and, uh, and Unsolvability, but also without full uh, comprehension. Peter Nauer became acquainted with Turing's work early on, but only studied it during the 1990s. Towards the end of his professorship, he asked several computer professionals in conferences whether they had ever heard of Turing's 1936 paper. The vast majority of answers were negative. Charles Bachmann, 1973 Turing Award winner, uh, did not really know who Turing was when he was awarded the prize. Um, this is just to show, these are not exceptions, this is just to show that Turing is very famous today, but he was less famous in, even in the early 1970s even amongst Turing Award winners. I give you some more uh, citations from first generation programmers. Grace Hopper, leading lady in uh, design and implementation of programming languages, said in 1978, I think I can remember sometime along in the middle of 1952 that I finally made the alarming statement that I could make a computer do anything which I could completely define. I'm still, of course, involved in proving that because I'm not sure if anybody believes me yet. Well, as, as a logician then, this is of course not possible. She was not a logician, that, I mean, so I'm, I'm taking it a bit out of context, but she was not versed in uh, computability theory because there are in fact things that um, can be well defined and uh, cannot be computed. John Reynolds, commenting on my book, said, I better admit that I haven't read Turing's 1936 paper, I probably avoid all papers less than most computer scientists, but I wasn't trained in logic and thus find the subject taxing to read, indeed more to read than to write, because his work is about logic. So he's a computer scientist, he works on separation logic, but so you see there's a divide between people like Kleene and Post and of course the computer scientists. Uh, Edsker Dijkstra, the 1972 Turing Award winner, uh, I discuss his work in this book, but I will not discuss it uh, here. He said that Turing's 1936 paper had, at least until 1950, not attracted much attention in the mathematical world at large. So he's talking about mathematicians, so let's forget the programmers for a moment. So even among mathematicians, it took some years for the Turing's paper to surface. Uh, and this statement by Dexter corresponds to what the historian Mark Priestley has investigated in his book, A Science of Operations. So then it, it becomes, of course, interesting to go and, and look at the proceedings and, and, and try to find out when, did, when and where the Turing's paper surfaced. And uh, I discussed different moments during the 1950s when this happened, but the most interesting is in 1959, when Andrew Booth, a keynote speaker, a very important researcher of his time, credited Turing as he who first enunciated the fundamental theorem upon which all automatic programming is based. So he was taking some ideas from Turing's paper, while many of his colleagues didn't even know who Turing was. He was one of those few who understood a lot of Turing's work and projected that onto his field of automatic programming. Automatic programming, we don't use those words anymore today, but Many practitioners in the field were concerned with the tediousness that goes into instructing a, a machine. So they wanted to uh, just specify the problem and then have the machine automatically compile that, that the specification into machine instruction. So that's what they call it automatic programming. And so he said in his keynote address, in its original form, the fear was so buried in a mass of mathematical logic that most readers would find it impossible to see the wood for the trees. Simply enunciated, however, it states that any computing machine which has the minimum proper number of instructions can simulate any other computing machine, however the large instruction repertoire of the latter. Uh, today, we, this is common knowledge, but they, they were starting to come to grips with that in the late 50s. 
Uh, he continued and he said, all forms of automatic programming are merely embodiments of this rather simple theory. And although from time to time we, the practitioners, may be in some doubt as to how one programming language differs from other programming notations, it will perhaps make things rather easier for our profession to bear in mind that there are simple consequences of Turing's theory. And so here lies the impact of Turing's 1936 paper on uh, programming practice. Um, Turing's 1936 paper helped explain a posteriori what people like Andrew Booth were doing. So these were coders, programmers, also computer builders. I also discussed Hassan Jäger in, in this book. Uh, engineers. Turing's paper served an educational and founding role because it helped engineers understand what they had accomplished independently of Turing and what they were going to accomplish with Turing's uh, theory as a roadmap. And so, um, in Barry Cooper's words, so this summer I received three emails uh, advertising this paper, so I, I decided to read it. Um, and I came across the following passage from his paper. He says Turing did not live long enough to see the yearly award of a prize in his name for a subject he played a founding role in. If founding is meant here in this a posteriori sense, then I, I agree with this. If it's meant in a more romantic manner, that Turing was was the first to invent a computer or something along those lines, then you won't find many professional historians agree with such a statement. So I leave it up to you to read his paper to find out what he means. I just want to stress um, that Konrad Zuse in Germany was already building computers before Trump even began writing his paper. Zuse in Germany and Aiken in the US already built universal computers before the end of the uh, Second World War, but they did not use the word universal to describe their machines because they did not rely on Turing's paper. They probably, at that time, did not even know who Turing was. Uh, in January 1945, before John von Neumann started working on what we today call stored program computers, he had just visited Mopti and Eckert, who were building the ENIAC machine, and he described the ENIAC machine is an absolutely pioneer venture, the first complete automatic all-purpose digital electronic computer. So, just to be clear that the Turing's paper did not lead to the first computer, it did not lead to the first universal computer, or the first stored program computer. I mean, if you look at what von Neumann and other actors say, it immediately refuted these claims, or the first program, or the first interpreter. Nevertheless, at Turing events this year, we have many keynote speakers making literally these kind of claims. There was no road from Turing to the first X, and I strongly recommend reading the paper by Marco, Michael Williams, who is a computer scientist and historian. The first computer where he explains why it is very foolish to make such claims. You can easily show something is not the first. It's very hard to prove something is the first. And it's actually beside the point, and that's, that's my main message, actually. Um, there was no road from Turing to the first X. Around 1946, not 1936, Turing started to see the practical implications of his theory of his universal machine, according to Turing's biographer, Andrew Hodges. So I'm not, this is a strong source. After the first, so Turing started to see this connection after the first general purpose computers had already been built, after he had done engineering work himself, like we saw yesterday, he, he, he was doing this kind of stuff, and after observing the work of several engineers. So many, if not, well, most historians did discredit the hourglass model, which it's, it's in the shape of an hourglass, it had these independent developments all coming together and then thanks to Turing's 1936 paper and the insights of von Neumann, we now have the first computer, we have programming languages, we have a computer science, etc. This is a very naive model and professional historians who are actually underrepresented at these Turing events will discredit this. Um, nevertheless, many theoreticians like this model because it puts theory on central stage. All practice emerges thanks to uh, a theoretical paper. And I'm giving you just one of many examples here by Robinson, who writes about logic computers, Turing and von Neumann, or the role of logic in computer science and artificial intelligence. 
uh, and he is one of many prominent researchers who defends this model. Of course, I'm, I'm, I'm making it explicit here what he is implicitly well, say, uh, saying in his, in his work. Historians distinguish between the hourglass model and would much rather talk about a seed model where you have parallel developments. So you have Sousa maybe here, Howard Aiken here, and Turing and Van Arman here. It's already more realistic. And I, um, I guess you could think about it even more and, and realize that this is also a bit simplistic. Of course you have developments coming together and then diverging, etc. Uh, to actually understand history as it really happened requires a lot of work and I strongly recommend this book by Paul Tseruzi from 2012. He spent a whole career and now he's able to write this book uh, and uh, it's just uh, fantastic how he puts Turing in context. So Turing was very important but so are other people and this is really, a, a, in my opinion, currently the Bible for uh, any historian. But why are we, logicians, computer scientists, why are we celebrating Turing? And in fact, many Turing events have been video recorded, you can look at them online. And you have Turing Award winners ex asking this question. You have many people asking, why are we celebrating Turing and not Church or somebody else? Uh, and I strongly believe, as I've tried to hint at, that many do this to promote one's research agenda, to strengthen the conviction that theory is superior to practice. This is certainly something that is, something like this has to do with it. The real historical question, however, is why was the Turing Prize awarded in 1966? So why was Turing honored in 1966 by awarding the prize in that year and onwards? I mean, so let's be serious. He is, he, he had a lot of impact in, in uh, computing because the prize was awarded. And that's the question I actually address in, in my book. And I would like to summarize, it were programmers. I, I talked about Andrew Booth in 1959. It was that community uh, that started to uh, hand out the Turing Award uh, in 1966. Uh, in 1966, the first Turing Award went to Alan Perlis for his contributions in the area of advanced programming techniques and compiler construction. So that's, the, that's automatic programming. It is only in the 1970s and later that you have prominent uh, computer scientists, logicians like uh, Randall Hodges, Robinson, Martin Davis popularized Turing's role in computer building. Um, only in recent years, or from the 1970s and onwards, but especially in recent years, we hear romantic claims about Turing, describing history as a beautiful road from Turing to practice. And this last citation is from Mary Cooper's paper, Turing as the inventor of the computer. And I, I, I strongly disagree with claims along these lines. Turing's influence lies more in programming after his death than in computer building during his lifetime. Uh, he did not have to be the first in anything. His paper, his theory, and that's what a good theory does, is it, it helped practitioners see the wood for the trees. It, helped grasp both prior and future developments and that's why he is uh, deservedly considered the father of computer science but for reasons that are actually not presented at Turing events. That's the ironic part. Thank you very much. <laughs>